All right, Terry, welcome to the group. And I'm going to answer your question regarding diffraction spikes. And I'm going to do it using this short video. And I'm going to throw it on my channel on YouTube because it may be informative to other people out there. And uh, again, welcome to the group. And um, I don't know that you'll ever get to know me any better than this. But if you do, you'll find that if an answer requires more than about a paragraph of typing, I'll always just do a short video because. I'm a visual learner and uh, and I prefer teaching visually more than uh, necessarily typing out words. So I'm going to answer your question. The spikes that you see in stars are not necessarily there because those objects are stars. They're there because that object is either emitting or reflecting light. And that light, as it travels from the source to the sensor or, you know, on a telescope, if you're doing astrophotography or your eyeball, whatever the case may be, it's being disturbed in some way. And those spikes are actually called diffraction spikes is the technical term. And so I'll explain them for you real quick. And it has to do with the nature of light. Light, as you very well may know, consists of particles called photons. But we've learned throughout the history of physics that light, these photons oftentimes can behave uh, as waves, they have very much character. They have they have characteristics very much like waves. They they can bend, they can diffract, they can wrap themselves around things, um, and I can amplify them or I can lower their intensity. And at the same time, light's behavior can also be described as that of a particle, which of course we call photons and we start getting into quantum physics. That whole principle is called the duality principle. And you can look it up on Wikipedia and learn how that based on what we're talking about with regards to light, we can talk about it in terms of particles or we can talk about it in terms of waves. In the case of diffraction spikes, we're going to talk about it in terms of waves. And I'm going to just draw I've got paint open here and I'm just recording my desktop and I'm just going to draw something and imagine that we're not talking about light, light, but we're talking about water and I throw a rock in the water and, and here comes some waves from the, the, where the rock landed right here. And suppose I have a log sitting half submerged, you know, on the, on the shore here. And you'll see that sometimes in real life as this wave front strikes this log, the very front of the wave front is blocked obviously, but this part that didn't get blocked actually works its way around and it actually can hook around and it's not very intense in this area but by the time you get over here and you know if we were to go from this log to some point over here and measure the intensity of the waves you'll find over here they're not much different than over here but over here you have a lot of disturbances and of course as we press through here i'll end up erasing this stuff but what ends up happening and let's say if we were to look at the water surface from the side oops wrong uh, device called up there and i don't even know how to call that sucker up sorry let's see if we can do this yeah if we were to look at the water surface from the side and this is a flat lake or a pond well we'd have waves like this right water waves from one source well if we you and i both were to throw a rock into the water and you created your own waves well at certain points along the surface of the water your the crest of your wave would join with the crest of my wave and whatever height your crest is would combine with the height of my crest so call this two inches and that's two inches well the combined effect of your wave on top of mine would be a four inch crest and of course a four inch uh, trough as well and we call this interference in this case it's constructive interference because we're actually building upon something else that's there in this case your wave is building upon my wave and down here it's called destructive interference because your uh i'm sorry this is also constructive because our troughs are being added but if we take your wave out of sync with my wave so let's say this is your wave here and this is my wave so where your trough meets my crest, they cancel out each other. And in fact, that is destructive interference. So neither one of our waves now has any intensity because we've canceled each other out. Sound uh, canceling headphones like Bose do this. There's a little, a, little, uh, a little microphone in the headset and it listens for external sounds. Then it takes those. And it creates a replica of that sound, but it phase shifts it 180 degrees so that the troughs and crests from that sound are canceled out by the troughs and crests 
created by the Bose headsets. So, and and and, and, I, and I, by the way, I'm doing this video just ad hoc without prep or anything. So if I misspeak and have to go back and go, no, wait, that's not what I meant. It's because I'm literally just, I read your question and I'm doing an answer right now. So much the same way light works, just like this log with water. Well, here on the backside, we've got some interference and you'll have some really big waves and then no waves at all. Some really big waves. And if you've ever heard the term, the perfect storm, the perfect wave, a rogue wave, you know, ships are just out in the middle of nowhere. And all of a sudden there's this 20 foot wave that came out of nowhere. It's simply because there were a multitude of waves with different sources out there, namely winds, but they all combined crests and troughs to form this rogue wave. Well, similarly, light does the same thing. And where the crests of light waves join, the light is more intense. And where the troughs join, the light there is more intense. But where light wave crests begin to meet with other source troughs, then you end up with cancellations. So what causes then more specifically to answer your question, the spikes? Well, in a Newtonian telescope, and you probably know this already. Well, let me call up the right tool here. In a Newtonian telescope, here's our optical tube assembly. And you've got your primary mirror on the back here. And of course, you got your diagonal or your secondary here. Well, it's held in place by this spider vein. And if we look down the middle of the tube, here's our secondary holder. Well, it's got these four what are called veins or the spider or spider veins. There's different names for it. And that's what they look like here. From the side, it looks like a vein. And we make them very thin looking from the front so that we have as, as little light as possible being blocked. But if you look at them from the side, they're pretty thick because there's a lot of tension on these. They got to be rigid. We don't want that secondary mirror moving at all. But what happens is the following. As a light wave, and what I call a light front, you know, waves can have fronts, strikes this vein right here. Well, on the backside, much like our log that was half submerged on the beach, those light waves end up being disturbed as they go around the vein. And eventually they kind of mellow out and form back to the original form that they were over here. But over here, there's been some changes in some intensity levels, whether up or down or some outright cancellations. And so the effect we have are the diffraction spikes that you saw in the picture. And that can be from any light source. So if I have a star, you're going to see diffraction spikes. If I have a uh, an asteroid, like in the case here, you know, a protoplanet, whatever you want to call it, Ceres, C-E-R-E-S, as you saw there in the photograph, that light source being a reflective light source is also going to uh, create diffraction spikes. Now, you don't see them on the moon. Why is that? Well, because typically the, the, the moon fills up almost the whole dadgum image. So, uh, and there's no dark background to see this effect in. You know, I have to have a dark background to see these spikes. So, for example, if I have a pinpoint star in my image, well, then obviously it's surrounded by a relatively dark background and you're going to see the spikes on there. Now, we talked about these spikes being related to the fact that there's a, a, um, a secondary or a diagonal mirror in front of the OTA over here, and I have four spider veins holding it in place. There are some scopes out there. Oh, let me draw this a little bit better. Here's our secondary. Some scopes out there have three spider veins, so you would see three diffraction spikes. Some telescopes do not have a secondary mirror, such as that of a refractor. So you don't see four, three, whatever diffraction spikes on an image from a refractor. But sometimes you'll see, if I can select the right tool here, you'll see, you know, if that's my pinpoint little star here, you'll see this little ring. Uh, it's a diffraction ring, you know, it's a, a, of high intensity, low intensity. Sometimes it emanates out from the star. And that's because anything at all that causes the light well, it's hard to explain. If I have light traveling through space and then through the Earth's atmosphere, any change in the way that light is traveling, i.e. a lens, uh, has the potential, and it usually does, to create some sort of diffraction, some sort of interference, construction, constructive interference, and destructive interference. So you will get sometimes these diffraction rings around refractors because the telescope lenses, their edges are not 
perfect, right? They're not perfect. And so, and by the way, I have to mount these lenses somehow. So sometimes there's a mounting ring around these lenses inside the OTA that stands for optical tube assembly. And so the light comes down there and it will be disturbed. And if there's a disturbance, you have troughs and crests that are joining each other to create destructive interference or canceling each other out if those waves are shifted 180 degrees. Uh, and, you know, when you're talking about sinusoidal waves on a Cartesian plane, uh, when you sh when you phase shift something 180 degrees, they cancel out. If you take two sinusoidal waves and phase shift them, that's like we talked about the Bose speakers. So sometimes, you know, if you've got mounting brackets for your mirror in your Newtonian telescopes, they'll they'll create weird spikes. Uh, I've had a mirror. If, if I were to draw a side view of an, you know, again, I'm no, no words for artistry here, but if this is my mirror. Well, obviously, the inside of it is coated for reflectivity. Well, I had a mirror that was missing coating. I mean, I'm telling you a tenth of a millimeter around almost the whole edge. Well, now I've changed the reflectivity of this area, and I was getting these weird, weird spikes called flares coming off my stars. And it, it took a year for me to figure out what, what was doing that. And, um, and then lastly, so that's what causes it. And lastly, I would encourage you to do the following and it's kind of an interesting experiment and uh i never heard anybody talk about this i kind of had to figure it out on my own when i started learning about you know light and how it behaves suppose this is the ground and i have a fence post you know or something and not big you know it's maybe two one to two inches square and but i have the sun up here and obviously there's going to be a shadow cast here well as the light from the light waves from the sun strike this thing on the back side you're going to have interference but that interference is very very minor so what's interesting is that the interfered you know the, the the disturbed light down here only has to travel a little ways to get to the ground and so if you look at the shadow cast by this pole right down here near the pole you'll find that its edges that's the shadow are really sharp I mean, there's a very sharp defined edge because the light hasn't had much distance to travel to screw up that edge, right? But up here, and remember the amount of um, interference is the same all along this back edge of the pole. But here, the, the light has much further distance to travel. And by the time it gets here, you'll find this edge is blurry. So if I were to look down at the shadow of this pole, I would find, and of course, the pole sitting right here. This is looking down on it. The poles right here. You'll find right here the edges of the shadow are really, really sharp. But as you work your way further, further out, they become blurry, and that's due to this destructive and constructive interference. In other words, diffraction, the diffraction of light. So there's your answer, and I hope that helped. And uh, I'm gonna post to YouTube, and I got a bunch of other th questions that I've answered for folks on this channel. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you got any others, uh, let me know. And to the rest of you out there, you subscribers, I appreciate it. Maybe this helped you with something. I don't know. Uh, and if you're a stranger uh, uh, here visiting us and you like what you saw in the other videos, I'd encourage you to click subscribe, ask questions, post comments. And I am not, uh, you know, I slept last night at a Holiday Inn Express. That's why I know some of this stuff. That's from an old commercial, if you remember it. Uh, but if you got something to add, if I got something wrong, if I messed up terminology, the physics, whatever, then uh, jump on and certainly leave a comment. And as I always say, almost in all of my videos, we should all be in the business of learning. And I'm certainly no exception to that. So if some of you out there maybe can teach me something. All right, guys, take care.